catechesis. What are other advances? Is? Basically, there are some other advances in the stands, in the imaging technology, and other uh, interventions also. So, new advances in stands. Basically, stands are available. There are the four generation. The first generation was the bare metal stands, in which the resistance was more than 20 percent. The second generation stands were the uh, drug reading stands. The resistance was 10 percent. The third generation now is the bioabsorbable polymer. And the final fourth uh, generation is the absorbable stands. You can see uh, this absorbable stand, so OCT images. At the base end, you can see the spread here. After six months, there is a, a less number of spread you can see. And after two years, the stand has dissolved at all. So you cannot see the stand after two years. So the indication for this bioabsorbable stands are to restore the vessel to a more natural state to eliminate the chronic source of vessel irritation and vessel remains free for the future treatment option, reduce the need for the prolonged dual antidepressive therapy, it allows for the use of non-invasive imaging techniques and improves the patient quality of life. Well, what is uh, new in the uh, imaging, particularly now the imaging of the cardiology? This has grown enormously in its all dimensions, particularly in the western part, they are doing almost all angioplasty are undergone with the imaging. What are the, these imaging? The number one imaging is the IVUS, that is the intravascular ultrasound. What we do, we put as ultrasound. This, what is the IVUS? IVUS is basically a combination of the echocardiography and a procedure called cardiac catheterization. IVUS uses, <laughs> IVUS uses a sound wave to produce an image. Uh, of the coronary artery and to see the condition, the sound wave travels through the tube called the catheter. So we put a catheter distal to the lesion, at the site of lesion and proximal to the lesion. And when we can see the arteries, we can see the arteries from the inside. Like this way, this is a normal artery you can see. You can see the uh, intima, you can see in the media or you can see the adventitia. All three parts you can see. And this is the disease artery, you can see a lot of plaque burden is there and we can manage this thing according to the plaque burden. What are the indication for the IVUS? IVUS is to be run to, uh, to see the normal, if patient has much severe chest pain and the normal coronary artery, please go for the IVUS to look for any ulcerated lesions. If patient has got intermediate lesions, suppose patient comes to you, he has got chest pain, this blocks are 60, 70 percent. Now you have to decide whether you should go for the angioplasty or should be managed medically. The IVUS is the best of best uh, mode of uh, mode of investigation, which will decide whether you should be subjected for, subject for the angioplasty or for medical management. If IVUS shows lesion is more than 70 percent, then you should be you should be uh, put a stand. And if it is less than 70 percent, you should be managed with the medicine. The IVUS is very useful in the unstable plaques. It is. The most important in case of left main artery, we are doing a lot of left main angioplasty. Almost all left main angioplasty should be done, should be done under cover of IVUS. And it is very useful in the, in the transplant coronary arteries and standing of the smaller arteries. You can see various plaques burden, you can see the irregularities, this irregularities, you can see the uh, uh, ulcerated lesions also here. The second most important modality for the imaging is the OCT. This is a newer one that is the optical coherence tomography. OCT is just like the IVUS in this. You can see the IVUS, you can, this is a color picture. This is the normal artery. You can see uh, uh, this is the vessel, vessel ball. This is the intima. Again, this is the media and adventitia. You can see that there is a calcified plaques. There are the fibrous plaques and there are the thin cap uh, fibroethromatous disease. You can see a lot of thrombus, clear thrombus can be seen in the OCT. Again, a lot of thrombus in the OCT. So by the uh, help of IVUS and OCT, we can uh, see the edge dissection, we can see the thrombus, we can see the malopositional stent, we can see the under dimensional stent and we can see the plaque protrusion through the stent. So this is a very, very important mode of treatment. Now the third mode is the FFR, that is Fraction Flow Reserve. What is FFR? FFR is a, basically is a ratio of the distal mean coronary pressure to the mean aortic pressure in the stenotic vessel. Suppose you have got a stenosis here, so to measure the mean pressure here and the aorta. And this is the mean pressure. 
If the mean pressure is less than 0.8, mean means your lesion is very significant. You should stent it. Stent the stent that artery. If your uh, FFR is more than 0.8, this is 0 0.84, 0.9, it means your lesion is not significant. Again, whenever we are in confusion whether this, whether we should in, uh, stent this particular lesion or not, we do either FFR or IOS or OCT. So you can see that the catheter is, uh, you can see here, the, basically this is a pressure diver microchip, there is a synotic lesion here. And you can see, uh, basically this is a tight lesion, the before the lesion you can see the FFR is uh, 0.7 and after the stenting the FFR is more than 0.8. The same is in here. Well, one new uh, advancement in the uh, in the treatment of uh, coronary artery disease is the rotablator. Basically, whenever a patient comes to you, he has got the one single vessel or double vessel disease, and the, uh, the lesion is calcified. The earlier the, all the patients were subjected for the bypass surgery, but nowadays all the patients are subjected for the rotablator. Rotablator is a very good technique. In this, we uh, put a, a, a rotaber. Basically, rotaber is a diamond piece. So this will rotate at the speed of 1,60,000 rotation per minute. 1,60,000 rotation per minute. This you can see the advancer. With the help of this advancer, we move the rotabed, uh, rota bulb. This is the console. This is the nitrous, oxys, uh, nitrous oxide, which is used for the movement of the bulb. This is a uh, foot pedal. I will show you an example. Basically, this is a tight region full of calcium. We were not able to even negotiate the wire. So, we did the uh, first, uh, we, we negotiated the wire with very difficulty and then uh, did the rota. After the rota, the, the passage is absolutely smooth and we were able to stand the artery and you can see the last end result is absolutely very good result. <coughs> What about the left main angioplasty? Again, left main angioplasty is again very, very difficult, very, very difficult to do. And the, all the left main angioplasty should be done under cover of IVERS. Make a point under cover of IVERS. So I'll tell you an example. The 50 years male has uh, diabetes and hypertensive, presented the severe chest pain with a profuse sweating. ECG showed ST patient anterior leaves and the CAG showed left main disease. The distal left main disease. This was ECG, more than 8 uh, ECG uh, leads are showing ST depression. So you can see the distal left main and the osteal LED lesion. So we did the left main to LED stenting with beautiful results. So you can see the stent here, nicely seen. Similarly, the bifurcation, what is the new advances in bifurcation lesion? Basically now we have got the good techniques. That is a tap technique or coolant techniques to do the bifurcation lesions. And we have got the dedicated bifurcation stents also. So I'm skipping this slide. Similarly, the chronic the total occlusion, again, a challenging cases for the cardiologist. And again, we have got very good uh, uh, modalities, uh, very good wires, very good balloons. And nowadays, we are doing not only the anti retrograde, uh, anti -rate, but we are doing the retrograde angioplasties also. The most important now is the, is the carotid angioplasty. So carotid angioplasty is very very important and we have developed uh, new uh, equipments for the uh, angioplasty which has made, made the angioplasty very very safe. As you know the stroke is one of the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. The incidence is 26%. The indication is if patient is symptomatic a lesion is more than 70%. Surgery usually become high risk in the elderly and those who associate with the cardiovascular diseases. Hence, carotid angioplasty has emerged as a viable alternative to uh, coronary endarterectomy. We have done 10 cases angioplasty in the last two months with 100% success. We always use distance protection device in such cases. I'll show you an example. You can see very tight lesion in the internal carotid artery, 99%. And after the stenting, you can see absolutely fine artery. Similarly, we are also doing a lot of peripheral angioplasties. We have got the newer stands for the angio peripheral angioplasty. Like 60 years lady with sinus of the left upper limb, peripheral angio showed 99% lesion at the proximal part of the left circulating artery and his limb was sinused. 
So we did the angiogram, the left subclavian artery is almost 99 to 100 percent occluded and we did the angioplasty, you can see the absolutely clear artery here, 100 percent clear. Similarly, we have got the good stands for the renal angioplasty, a young patient at 20 years, being presented with a malignant hypertension, angiography showed renal artery stones is 99 percent, this is 99 percent renal artery and we did the angioplasty, after angioplasty, absolutely fine, blood pressure is controlled with the one drug only. Similarly, the bronchial artery embolization, the patients having a lot of hemoptysis, massive hemoptysis, can be treated can, with the bronchial artery embolization. The leading cause of hemoptysis is the tuberculosis. Surgical lobectomy is effective treatment but causes a lot of morbidity and mortality. Percutaneous bronchial artery embolization is safe effective treatment for the persistent hemoptysis with the success rate more than 90 percent. Some example you can see this is Lima artery which is giving a lot of collateral load of this is the cavity and giving the uh, causing the hemoptysis and after the embolization you, you, you can see the blushes have gone. Similarly second the bronchial artery is also giving a lot of blushes massive hemoptysis and after the embolization the, the blushes is gone. So we are doing a lot of pediatric work also. So we are doing the ASD, D, BSD, PDA, rupture sinus also uh, closer with the device. The treatment, convention, convention treatment is the surgery. But nowadays all ASD, if all PDAs, all RSOB, we have replaced them surgery, uh, replaced the surgery by the devices. This treated convention by the surgery, device closure is safe and effective. 100% successful in appropriately selected patients. Avoid the morbidity and mortality. Patient can be discharged on the same day or the very next day. So what we do, like this is a uh, uh, atrial septal defect. So we put a uh, basically AC device closure, uh, device closure. So one disc is left in the LA and second disc is left in the RA and then the device is released. So I can show you the example, this is the cath lab. So this is the uh, ASD device, you can see. Another AC device you can see here. Similarly, this is the PDA, patent tectus arteriosus, this is the aorta, this is the pulmonary artery, you can see the connection here. And after the putting the PDA device, you can see that the PDA has closed. And similarly, this is the rupture sinus of Balsalva, so opening into the uh, aorta into the RA, so this is after putting a device, you can see absolutely the flow has stopped. So this is life saving procedures which are, we are doing regularly. Now the heart failure devices, very very new in the, in the last uh, last decade we have got the two very important innovations in the field of cardiology. One is heart failure devices and second is TAVI, that is aortic valve replacement. Little bit, only uh, two minutes in this. Basically heart failure devices is the CRT, this is the cardiac resynchronized therapy. Basically we put the CRT in a patient, when the patient has a normal coronary artery, his ejection fraction is less than 30% and uh, uh, he is symptomatic and ECG is showing left bundle branch block. You have to fulfill three conditions, LBB, normal coronary, ejection free less than 30%. CRT is very, very effective to prevent the basically the recurrent failures. You can see CRT here, you, you have to put three wires, one into RA, second into RV and third in the LB. Similarly, AICD useful in the patient with the recurrent VTVF, patient ejection free less than 30% should be subject for AICD. This will prevent your sudden cardiac death. And the third is a combo device. This is the combination of CRT plus AICD. The patient receives CRT dysfunction with recurrent VT. Recurrent VT. You can see that there is the device, combo device, similar to this. We have put the, uh, here are the three wires. You can see one in the RA, one in the LA, and one in the LV. And you can see the AICD also. The last is the TAVI. TAVI is the, basically this is the newer uh, uh, modality of treatment of uh, aortic stenosis. If a patient, elderly patient, have severe AS, the earlier only method was surgery. Nowadays, per cutaneous, we can change the aortic valve. So this is the basically aortic valve. You can change the aortic valve by, by through your femoral root. So this is the aortic valve. Putting this wall, how to put this? Thing. The replacement, or doing this replacement. This can be done through the apical root also. You can through the apical root also. So these are the various walls, 
this is a typical uh, aortic valve which we place. Uh, we place at the, the region of aortic valve. This is the. This is the angio pictures. Thank you, thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash Chandwani. Dr. Prakash Chandwani is a director and the chief international cardiologist at, at Heart and General Hospital. Now, I would like to invite Dr. David Sir. I was using, I was using a sound wave to produce an image uh, of the coronary artery and to see the condition. The sound wave travels through the tube called the catheter. So, we put a catheter distal to the lesion at the site of lesion and proximal to the lesion and when we can see the arteries we can see the arteries from the inside like this way this is a normal artery you can see you can see the uh, intima you can see in the media or you can see the adventitia all three parts you can see and this is the disease artery you can see a lot of plaque burden is there and we can manage this thing according to the plaque burden what are the indication for the IVAS? I was used to be to, uh, to see the normal, if patient has much severe chest pain and the normal coronary artery, please go for the I was to look for any ulcerated lesions. If patient has got intermediate lesions, suppose patient comes to you, he has got chest pain, his blocks are 60-70%. Now you have to decide whether you should go for the angioplasty or should be managed medically. So I was is the best of, best uh, mode, of, uh, mode of investigation which will decide whether you should be subjected for, subject for the angioplasty or for medical management. If I was shows lesion is more than 70%, then he should be, he should be uh, put a stand. And if it is less than 70%, he should be managed with the medicine. The IVAS is very useful in the unstable plaques. It is the most important in case of left main artery. We are doing a lot of left main angi angioplasty. Almost all left main angioplasty should be done, should be done under cover of IVAS. And it is very useful in the, in the transplant corner arteries and standing of the smaller arteries. You can see various plaques burden, you can see the irregularities, this irregularities, you can see the uh, uh, ulcerated lesions also here. The second most important modality for the imaging is the OCT. This is a newer one that is the optical coherence tomography. OCT is just like the IVAS in this, you can see the IVAS, this is a color picture. This is the normal artery, you can see. Uh, uh, this is the vessel, vessel ball, this is the intima, again this is the media and adventitia. You can see that there is a calcified plaques, there are the fibrous plaques and there are the thin capped uh, fibroathromatous disease. You can see a lot of thrombus, clear the thrombus can be seen in the OCT. Again a lot of thrombus in the OCT. So, by the uh, help of IVAS and OCT, we can uh, see the edge dissection, we can see the thrombos, we can see the malapositional stent, we can see the underdimensional stent, and we can see the plaque protrusion through the stent. So, this is a very, very important mode of treatment. Now, the third mode is the FFR, that is fraction flow reserve. What is FFR? FFR is a basically is a ratio of the distal mean coronary pressure to the mean aortic pressure in the stenotic vessel. Suppose you have got a stenosis here, so to measure the mean pressure here and the aorta, and this is the mean pressure. If the mean pressure is less than 0.8, mean, means your lesion is very significant. You should stent it. Stent that artery. If your uh, FFR is more than 0 0.8, this is 0 0.84, 0 0.9, it means your lesion is not significant. Again, whenever we are in confusion whether this, whether we should in, uh, stand this particular lesion or not, we do either FFR or IVS or OCT. So you can see that the catheter is, uh, you can see here, the, basically this is a pressure diver microchip, there is a synotic lesion here. And you can see, uh, basically this is a tight lesion, the before the lesion you can see the FFR is uh, 0.7 and after the stamping the FFR is more than 0.8. The same is here. Well, one new uh, advancement in the uh, in the treatment of uh, coronary artery disease is the rotablator. 
basically whenever a patient comes to you, he has got the one single vessel or double vessel disease and the, uh, the lesion is calcified. The earlier the, all the patients were subjected for the bypass surgery, but nowadays all the patients are subjected for the rotavator. Rotavator is a very good technique. In this, we uh, put a, a, a rotavator. Basically, rotavator is a diamond piece. So this will rotate at the speed of 1,60,000 rotation per minute. 1,60,000 rotation per minute. This you can see the advancer. With the help of this advancer, we move the rotavator. Uh, rota bulb. This is the console. This is the nitrous oxide, uh, nitrous oxide, which is used for the uh, movement of the bulb. This is a uh, foot pedal. I will show you an example. Basically, this is a tight region full of calcium. We were not able to even negotiate the wire. So we did the uh, first uh, with, with negotiate the wire with very difficulty, and then uh, did the rota. After the rota, the, the passage is absolutely smooth. And we were able to stand the artery, and you can see the last end result is absolutely very good result. <coughs> what about the left main angioplasty? Again, left main angioplasty is again very, very difficult, very, very difficult to do. And the, all the left main angioplasty should be done under cover of IVERS. Make a point under cover of IVERS. So I'll tell you an example. The 50 years male. Uh, this diabetic and hypertensive presented the severe chest pain with a profuse sweating. ECG showed ST infection and anterior leaves, and the CAG showed left main disease. The distal left main disease, this was ECG, more than eight uh, ECG uh, leaves are showing ST depression. So you can see the distal left main and the osteal LED lesion. So we did the left main to LED stenting with beautiful results. So you can see the stand here, nicely seen. Similarly, the bifurcation, what is the new advances in bifurcation lesion? Basically now we have got the good techniques, that is the tap technique or pulling techniques to do the bifurcation lesions. And we have got the dedicated bifurcation stands also. So I am skipping this slide. Similarly, the chronic total occlusion, again a challenging cases for the cardiologist. And again, we have got very good uh, uh, modalities, uh, very good wires, very good balloons. And nowadays, we are doing not only the anti retrograde, uh, anti-rate, but we are doing the retrograde angioplasties also. The most important now is the, is the carotid angioplasty. So, carotid angioplasty is very, very important, and we have developed a new uh, equipments for the angioplasty which has made, made the angioplasty very very safe. As you know the stroke is one of the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. The incidence is 26%. The indication is if patient is symptomatic a lesion is more than 70%. Surgery usually become high risk in the elderly and those who associate with the cardiovascular diseases. Hence carotid angioplasty has emerged as a viable alternative to uh, coronary endotectomy. We have done 10 cases angioplasty in the last two months with 100% success. We always use distance protection device in such cases. I will show you an example. You can see very tight lesion in the internal carotid artery, 99%. And after the stenting, you can see absolutely fine artery. Similarly, we are also doing a lot of peripheral angioplasties. We have got the newer stands for the angio peripheral angioplasty. Like 60 years lady with sinuses of the left upper limb, peripheral angio showed 99% lesion at the proximal part of the left circulating artery and his limb was sinused. So we did the angiogram, the left circulating artery is almost 99 to 100% occluded and we did the angioplasty, you can see the absolutely clear artery here, 100% clear. Similarly, we have got the good stands for the renal angioplasty. A young patient at 20 years, male, presented with a malignant hypertension. Angiography showed renal artery smooth is 99%. This is 99% renal artery. And we did the angioplasty. After angioplasty, absolutely fine. Blood patients controlled with the one drug only. Similarly, the bronchial artery embolization. The patients having a lot of hemoptysis, massive hemoptysis can be treated with the bronchial artery embolization. The leading cause of hemoptysis is the tuberculosis. Surgical lobectomy is effective treatment but causes a lot of morbidity and mortality. Percutaneous bronchial artery embolization is safe, effective treatment for the persistent hemoptysis with a success rate more than 90%.
Some example you can see this is Lima artery which is giving lot of collateral load of this is the cavity and giving the uh, causing the hemophysis. And after the embolization, you, you, you can see the blushes are gone. Similarly, second the bronchial artery is also giving a lot of blushes, massive hemophysis, and after the embolization, the, the blushes are gone. So we are doing a lot of pediatric work also. So we are doing the ASD, D, BSD, PDA, rupture sinus also uh, closer with the device. The treatment, the convention, uh, convention treatment is the surgery. But nowadays all ASD, if all PDAs, all RSOB, we have replaced them surgery, uh, replaced the surgery by the devices. This treated convention by the surgery, device closure is safe and effective. 100% successful in appropriately selected patients. Avoid the morbidity and mortality. Patient can be discharged on the same day or the very next day. So what we do, like this is a uh, uh, atrial septal defect. So we put a uh, basically AC device closure, uh, device closure. So one disc is left in the LA and second disc is left in the RA and then the device is released. So I can show you the example, this is the cat lab. So this is the uh, ASD device, you can see. Another ASD device you can see here. Similarly, this is the PDA, patent tectus arteriosus, this is the aorta, this is the pulmonary artery, you can see the connection here. And after the putting the PDA device, you can see that the PDA has closed. And similarly, this is the rupture sinus of Balsalva, so opening into the uh, aorta into the RA, so this is after putting a device, you can see absolutely the flow has stopped. So this is the life saving procedures which are, we are doing regularly. Now the heart failure devices, very very new in the, in the last uh, last decade we have got the two very important innovations in the field of cardiology one is heart failure devices and second is TAVI that is aortic valve replacement little bit only uh, two minutes in this basically heart failure devices is the CRT this is the cardiac resynchronized therapy basically we put the CRT in a patient when the patient has a normal coronary arteries his ejection fraction is less than 30 percent and uh, uh, he is symptomatic and ECG is showing left bundle branch block you have to fulfill three conditions. LBB, normal coronary, ejection free less than 30%. CRT is very, very effective to prevent the basically the recurrent failures. You can see CRT here. You, you have to put three wires, one into RA, second into RV, and third in the LB. Similarly, AICD useful in the patient with the recurrent VTVF, patient ejection free less than 30% should be suggested for AICD. This will prevent your sudden cardiac death. And the third is a combo device. This is the combination of CRT plus AICD. The patient received a dysfunction with recurrent VT. Recurrent VT. You can see that there is the device combo device similar to this. We have put the, uh, here and the three wires. You can see one in the RA, one in the LA, and one in the LV. And you can see the AICD also. The last is the TAVI. TAVI is the, basically this is the newer uh, uh, modality of treatment of uh, aortic stenosis. If a patient, elderly patient, have severe AS, the earlier only method was surgery. Nowadays, per cutaneous, we can change the aortic valve. So this is the basically aortic valve. You can change the aortic valve by, by through your femoral root. So this is the aortic valve. Putting this wall, how to put this? Thing. The replacement to make this replacement. This can be done through the apical root also. You can through the apical root also. So these are the various walls. This is a typical uh, aortic valve which we place. Uh, we place at the, uh, the region of aortic valve. This is the, this is the angio pictures. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Prakash Chandwani. Dr. Prakash Chandwani is a director and the chief interventional cardiologist at, at Heart and General Hospital. Now, I would like to invite Dr. David sir.
things to me. Quest, in fact, and the 
and it is continuous and there are natural substances such as Datura, Belladonna, Hebane which are the three ingredients which were used for sexual organs in ancient fertility cults. Yohimbin has been long been used by the natives of Faric Africa to enhance their sexual prowess as was the mandrake plant in medieval Europe. So, but these things had limitations, limitations of how do we put them in the responses, how do we measure them, was there any concern about female sexuality taken, so there were a lot of limitations. But these pharmacological agents were potential to directly influence the motivation or pleasure components of sexual response has now been studied and they are called psychopharmacological drugs instead of vascular pharmacological drugs. There are certain neurotransmitter mechanisms which facilitate certain, which inhibit the sexual functions, amongst which dopamine increases the arousal, orgasm, norepinephrine, serotonin, all decrease the effects of sexual response, acetylcholine, GABA also, acetylcholine increases, GABA decreases. So, there is, we have four things which you all remember. One is we have dopamine agonists. We live in a dopaminergic society. We need to be dopaminergic. When an injection of dopaminergic drugs was given into the lateral ventricle and medial pre-optic area, they found increase in the copulatory rate and number of ejaculations. So dopaminergic stimulation of the ventral stratum affects the sex drive and dorsal part affects the intromission and ejaculations. And when we give dopamine antagonists like haloperidol or benperidol, it was associated with diminished sexual response. So one thing is proven that dopamine is very good for Second is alpha adrenergic blockers, which like chlorine, etc. They reduce erections and ejaculation was studied in male and even in feet, even in humans today. So if you give serotonin, is another inhibitory neurotransmitter. So all said and done, human studies on pro-sexual drugs have been proven. If you give dopamine agonists, which patients take for Parkinson's disease, they have reduced sex drive. If they take dopamine agonist, amantadine, which increases the sexual desire, pregolide and used for Parkinson's disease patients have spontaneous erections and ejaculations. Alpha adrenergic urum yohibin is now poor. A lot of studies to do. Trazodone is there as an antidepressant which is used, decreases the it decreases the prolactin and increases the sustainance of erection. Bupropion inhibits the uptake of dopamine and acts as a dopamine agonistic. So, but we have a lot of dilemmas with these drugs as they have a lot of potential side effects. So, should we give drugs to our patients who need aphrodisiacs or who need good desire? So, what actually are aphrodisiacs? Aphrodisiacs are nothing but substances that induce or enhance sexual desire. Amongst the food which we all take in day to day life, all red colored fruits, red colored vegetables, all green vegetables, cows, ghee, cows, milk, garlic, onion, ginger, sesame seed, flax seed, saffron, oats, mushrooms, vanilla, almonds, walnuts, honey, white of the boiled egg and fish are supposed to be the best aphrodisiac foods which are available to us. Why red color? Because we know of all the seven chakras, the root chakra is the mulhara which gets excited only with red color. Certain fruits like cherries, chilies, figs, pomegranate, red colored fruits, chocolates, Chocolates, dark chocolates contains phenylalanine, which is an amino acid, which boosts your arousal and enhances your Red colored vegetables, carrots, tomatoes were known as a love apple, zinc, flax seeds, walnuts, chocolates. Red lingari also excites, also has been proved to be an aphrodisiac. Other deer horn, deer legs, complete roots, etc., goat head, coral rock, opus, bronze, silver, everything. So what actually we need is, nitric oxide. What is the science behind nitric oxide? It helps in the sexual health. It produces, it, once it enters into the corpora cavernosa, it converts the GTP into CGMP and this discoverers got a Nobel Prize. And the function of nitric oxide is all we are all aware. It is a vasodilator, anti-thrombotic, anti etherogenic and it is a cellular currency. Why it has been described as a molecule of life? Because you can live for three to seven minutes without oxygen, but without nitric oxide, you can survive not more than five to ten seconds. So, bottom line of normal sexual function is, if you have no nitric oxide, you cannot have sex. 
So where does this nitric oxide come from? On stimulation, nitric oxide is formed by the enzymes of endothelium which convert L-arginine into nitric oxide. And this ability of the endothelium has to be maintained. Even females need this. So however, the production of nitric oxide, the main signaling molecule, is only one of the metabolic pathways that is fueled by L-arginine. So nitric oxide which we get from L-arginine is important. Now this L-arginine is nothing else but a nutraceutical. The term nutraceutical was coined by the word nutrition and pharmaceutical by Stephen D. These help in sexual dysfunctions. Nutrition plays a significant impact on our physiological processes. So we need to understand and take these nutraceuticals in an adequate quantity because nitric oxide as such decreases as we age. Enough studies to prove that in erectile dysfunction, L-arginine is useful. Lot of studies, I will not go into the details of it. Epimedium, Ilkarlin, L-citrulline, oral L-citrulline has been proved. Pine bark, Pignogenol, Shila G has got lot of ephrodite. Phenobreak in saponized form also has an effect exactly like free testosterone. So there is a clear cut study to prove that phenobreak saponized form along with L-arginine increases not only the desire but it facilitates the, the erectogenic mechanism. A lot of clinical evidence to be testophen is there, ferrosap which has been tried. All these increased frequencies of morning erection, sexual intercourse after 12 months. Zinc, micronutrient, also helps. Magnesium helps. Spiridoxin helps. The other things which are available to us are herbs in the form of Macuna purins, Yohimpin bark, our Indian pride is Ayurveda. Plants have been identified with various ethno-botanical surveys with having aphrodisiac activity. And amongst them is the Vaji Karnas. The Vaji means horse and Karana means making, making it. So the measure to excite lust and charm is by Vaji Karana. Not some studies even in Ayurveda have been tried. Ashwagandha has tried. Gokshura has been tried. Kapil Vachu has been tried. Safed Musli. I am not going into the detail because it's really boring. But we must remember that there is something like these available. Kali Musli. All these have pleiotropic effect of giving you physiological erections, reduction in cholesterol, control diabetes, reduce hypertension and they are powerful antioxidants and they have absolutely no side effects. Even saffron. Other herbs are ginseng which is nothing, it means like a mat. It's a sacred herb, ginkgo biloba found in Shin, Shuken in, China, in Japan has also been very important. Aromatherapy stimulates sexual energies. So what we need is today a very rested body, adequate time, privacy, a conducive environment, a relaxed state of mind and an attraction for the partner will have the same effect. The second most important need is our own health. We should control our hypoglycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, etc. The Nobel Prize winner in literature in 1990 was awarded to Octavia Pass for impassioned writing with wide horizons characterized by sensuous intelligence and humanistic intelligence. He says erotism and gastroscopy are two most important fundamental pleasures of life. Erotism is the most intense and gastrosphobia is most extended. So desire in both of these initiates a movement among substances, the bodies and the sensations. Even Kama Sutra and Kofum Gaya also mention various foods which I mentioned to you and concussions to aid and enhance sexuality. Chocolates have been consumed even with the thought of being erotic. So it's not about love, we must try and understand each other. It is not sex that gives you pleasure, but the lover and the certain other things. We need to come out of the cultural myth that phenovaginal sex is the only thing which is needed. Phallocentrism should be abandoned from our mind. We also should look at variety to bring in, in the spice, which is the spice of life. Initiate your sex in the varied manner. Don't become monotonic, monotony like uh, which is set in an erotic boredom. Try new things in bed which is required. Bind things when lovers really love, they bind. They are nothing but love modes. A lot of furniture also gives you aphrodisiac effects. We have scriptures. So the key to having best 
feeling of what aphrodite I do is try and give a U-turn to your metabolic imbalance. Do lifestyle modifications. Use 64 different positions rather than using 64 different partners, which is important. Try which position suits you. Hugging is a good medicine. You can't give one without getting one. So we have now understood what we actually need. So one keeps asking, did I marry the right person? The key to succeeding in marriage is not an adequate quantity because nitric oxide as such decreases as we age. Enough studies to prove that in erectile dysfunction, enlargement is useful. Lot of studies, I will not go into the details of it. Epimedium, Ilcarline, L-citrulline, oral L-citrulline has been proved. Pine bark, Pycnogenol, Shilajit has got a lot of Ephrodite. Phenobrigid saponized form also has an effect exactly like free testosterone. So there is a clear-cut study to prove that phenobrigid saponized form along with LRGD increases not only the desire but it facilitates the the electrogenic mechanisms. A lot of clinical evidence to be testophile is there, ferrosap which has been tried. All these increased frequencies of morning erection, sexual intercourse after 12 months. Zinc, micronutrient, also helps. Magnesium helps. Pyridoxin helps. The other things which are available to us are herbs in the form of macuna purins, leohimpic bark, our Indian pride is Ayurveda. Plants have been identified with various ethno-botanical surveys with having aphrodisiac activity. And amongst them is the Vaji Karanas. The Vaji means horse and Karana means making, making it. So the measure to excite lust and charm is by Vaji Karana. Not some studies even in Ayurveda have been tried. Ashwagandha has tried. Gokshura has been tried. Kapil Vachu has been tried. Safed Musli. I am not going into the detail because it's a little boring, but we must remember that there is something like these available. Kali, Musli, all these have pleiotropic effect of giving you physiological erections, reduction in cholesterol, control diabetes, reduce hypertension, and they are powerful antioxidants and they have absolutely no side effects. Even saffron. Other herbs are ginseng, which is nothing, it means like a mat. It's a sacred herb, ginkgo biloba, found in Shin. Shukin in, China, in Japan has also been very important. Aromatherapy stimulates sexual energies. So what we need is today a well rested body, adequate time, privacy, a conducive environment, a relaxed state of mind and an attraction for the partner will have the same effect. The second most important need is our own health. We should control our hypoglycemia, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, etc. The Nobel Prize winner in literature in 1990 was awarded to Octavia Pass for impassioned writing with wide horizons characterized by sensuous intelligence and humanistic intelligence. He says erotism and gastrophobia are two most important fundamental pleasures of life. Erotism is the most intense and gastrophobia is most extended. So desire in both of these initiates a movement among substances, the bodies and the sensations. Even Kama Sutra and Kofum Gaya also mention various foods which I mentioned to you and concussions to aid and enhance sexuality. Chocolates have been consumed even with the thought of being erotic. So it's not about love. We must try and understand each other. It is not sex that gives you pleasure, but the lover and the certain other things. We need to come out of the cultural myth that phenovaginal sex is the only thing which is needed. Phallocentrism should be abandoned from our mind. We also should look at variety to bring in, in the spice, which is the spice of life. Initiate your sex in the varied manner. Don't become monotonic, monotony like uh, which will set in an erotic boredom. Try new things in bed which is required. Binding, when lovers really love, they bind. They are nothing but love modes. A lot of furniture also gives you aphrodisiac effects. We have scriptures. So the key to having best feeling of what aphrodisiac do is try and give a U-turn to your metabolic imbalance. Do lifestyle modifications. Use 64 different positions rather than using 64 different partners, which is important. Try which position suits you. 
Hugging is a good medicine. You can't give one without getting one. So we have now understood what we actually need. So one keeps asking, did I marry the right person? The key to succeeding in marriage is not how important it is to stay connected when you're on the go. Simply request a guiding hand, and within seconds, we'll be at your side, ready to guide you to your destination. Let us navigate your world so you can navigate the web. Your guiding hand will take care of all the pesky distractions that once forced you to look up. We look out for you so you can keep an eye on the things that matter. Enjoy the security that comes in knowing you are finally, truly connected. You'll never have to look up again. This is my book, Sex Has No Expiry Date, available on Amazon. So friends, your intelligence, your innocence, your self-confidence, your fantasy, and your excited partner are the best introductions. There is no magic pill. Some of you are not satisfied with that. And this is a global problem. Constipation is a global problem. Every country, at least 30% of the people of that country are constipated in one or some other way. In our country, the incidence is much more. Every second person feels that he is constipated. His meaning of constipation is different in different ways and scientific meaning of constipation is different. So, constipation is a symptom, not a disease. As we all know, that we have a traditional system of passing fishes, sweating on a commode, and there is a western way of going to motions, that is sitting on a commode. So, the, normally there is an angle, anorectal angle, which is very important whether uh, you will evacuate your fishes properly, or not. This angle is normally 80 to 180 degree. Once it straightens, there is an easy passage of the feces. So, a patient who comes to us with constipation, he presents in many ways. He may present with pain abdomen, bloating, straining during bowel movement, sensation of incomplete evacuation, sensation of anorectal obstruction and blockage, and infrequent stools. But in our country, many patients who come with a complaint of constipation, they have a false sense that they have not evacuated their bowel completely. And the reason for this thinking is that they feel that abdomen is not completely relaxed. It is distended. It is full. This is their wrong interpretation. Abdominal fullness in these patients is because of accumulation of the fat and gases because of aerophasia due to anxiety. They feel that if they pass the motion the way they want, they will have a relaxed, empty abdomen. Uh, but, but the reality is not like this. So this is another symptom. The distension of the abdomen, even after passing motion, they feel they are constipated, which is not the true thing. So there may be two types of constipation, primary or functional constipation, or secondary cause of constipations are there. Uh, how do we diagnose constipation? There are wrong criteria for diagnosis of constipation. There are multiple wrong criteria, now wrong four criteria. They say that two or more of the six should be present to diagnose a patient having constipation. Straining during more than 25% times of defecations. More than 25% defecation, there is a straining. Then lumpy or hard stools on more than 25% occasions. Sensation of incomplete evacuation for more than 25% of evacuations. And 
sensation of anorectal obstruction or blockage for more than 25% of medications. Or a patient requires manual maneuvers like uh, uh, more than 25% of time like digital evacuation, support of the pelvic floor and fewer than three motions per week. These are the criteria laid by the Rome Consensus Committee. But in Indian scenario, a person, even if he goes for three times in a day, he feels constipated. Everybody has got a fixed idea about how much stool he should pass. He is calculating the amount of the stool based on the oral intake of the food. Many patients think that they have consumed six chapatis, so they must pass 300 grams of the stools, which is not the thing, uh, right thing. The amount of the uh, stool which is passed depends upon many things and not only the quantity of the food, quality of the food, fiber content of the food, water content of the food. But in Indian studies, it has been shown that passing less than one stool per day can be considered as a constipation. But overall, all over the world, less than two stools per week are considered as constipation. Then there are multiple secondary causes of constipation like central nervous system diseases, uh, endocrinal diseases, irritable bowel syndrome. This is a very common cause of constipation all over the world and especially in our country. And this is male predominant disease in our country. And it, in, all, in all the patients of constipation, it constitutes about around 16% uh, of the constipation causes. Then various drugs, they can produce constipation like NSAIDs, or anticholinergics, antihistaminics, psychotropic drugs, antidepressants, and various other drugs which you can see. Uh, and then, then hypothyroidism and hypercalcemia, chronic kidney disease, they can all produce constipation. So in a patient with constipation, we must exclude the secondary causes of constipation before labeling this patient as an idiopathic constipation. Then there are various risk factors for constipation. Advancing age, female gender, low level of education, low level of physical activity, lower socio-economic conditions, uh, non-white ethnicity and drug-induced constipations. And these are the types of the stools which we pass. And based on the appearance of the stool, one can decide what is the colonic transit, what is the transit of the contents throughout the colon. The type 1, which is the separate hard lump style of stool, it, it, can, it means the patient has got very prolonged colonic transit. So, if we go from 1 to 7, 7 is the practically normal colonic transit. So, there are the, this is called Bristol stool chart. Based on the appearance of the stool, one can make out what is the colonic transit. Then, constipation uh, can be considered in three ways. Normal transit constipation, the colonic transit is normal, but the patient still has got constipation. He has got a sensation of incomplete evacuation, but results of the physiological tests are normal. There is a slow transit constipation where there is an infrequent stool passage less than one per week, but in India less than one per week uh, per day, then lack of pulse, poor response, like so many uh, things are there. And then another is defecatory disorders where there is a dysfunction of the pelvic floor, anismus, descending peri uh, perineum, and rectal prolapse. All these can produce constipation. So uh, most Indian studies. They have shown that uh, functional constipation is seen in 58% of the patients, whereas irritable bowel syndrome is seen in 19% of the patients, where the male predominance is there. Functional constipation is more common in females. And another Indian study where they have shown that less than uh, five stools per week can be considered as constipation, as opposed to the international definitions, where less than two stools per week is considered as constipation. Then there are certain alarming features in a patient with constipation. If a patient is more than 45 years of age, having constipation for the first time, change in the stool caliber, blood in the stool, or there is an unintentional weight loss, fever, abdominal masses on palpation, family history of GI cancers, or there is anemia or iron deficiency type, and recent onset constipation, bleeding per rectum, prolapse of the rectum, vomiting and loss of appetite. If all these factors are pr present, one should be concerned about the presence of organic cause of constipation rather than idiopathic constipation. So, how do we clinically evaluate the patient of constipation? Uh, in the history, we ask for prolonged standing to explain the stool, injection of uh, unusual posture on the toilet to facilitate stool expulsion, 
support of perineum, digital, uh, digitalization of the rectum, or application of pressure to the posterior vaginal wall to facilitate rectal emptying, inability to expel uh, enema fluid, and constipation after surgery.